My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. The Leader Assistant Podcast is exclusively brought to you by Goody, which provides effortless gifting for all occasions. If you're tired of sending tacky, impersonal business gifts, then you should definitely check out Goody. My friends at Goody offer a collection of hundreds of curated brands like Levain Bakery, Therabody, Milk Bar, and Ember Mugs. With Goody, if your recipient doesn't like your gift, they can swap it out for one they do like. You can find perfect gifts for any occasion, whether it's work anniversaries, birthdays, new hire onboarding, or company swag. It's free to start gifting, and you get a $20 credit when you sign up. Also, be sure to mention the Leader Assistant Podcast when signing up, and Goody will add an extra $10 credit to your account. So go to leaderassistant.com slash Goody to disrupt the inefficiencies in your team's gifting strategy. Again, that's leaderassistant.com slash goody. Hey friends, welcome to episode 166. You can catch the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 166. Today's episode is a replay of the weekly leader assistant Zoom chat, a recent session that we had with my friend Monique Hellstrom, former chief of Simon Sinek, best-selling author and TED Talk speaker. Monique and I talk about how to have tough conversations. So we chatted for about 25 minutes with some friends of ours all over the world. That would be you, Leader Assistants, because weekly we have a free Zoom chat on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern. We have a quick 30-minute Zoom chat every Wednesday. You are welcome to join us for a future one. Just go to leaderassistant.com slash community. We use a platform called Circle for the Leader Assistant community, and you can join and click on weekly Zoom chats and get all of the dial-in info so you can join us for a future call. All right. Well, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Monique Hellstrom. Be sure to check out her resources at moniquehellstrom.com. Monique was executive assistant chief of staff to Simon Sinek, a leadership guru. So she supported Simon throughout his crazy, crazy boom and growth of his, his business and influence with leaders all over the world. So she has plenty of great uh, assistant experience, um, but then now she trains and coaches and speaks um, and helps assistants and executives And one topic that she helps them with and helps us as assistants with is communication and having hard conversations. And so it's a very, very uh, big part of our jobs, especially uh, us leader assistants, because leaders don't run from the hard conversation. They lean into them and they have them. And so I'm going to let Monique kind of share a little bit. I'm going to kind of ask her a couple questions to get her, get her talking. And then I will open it up for questions from you all. So uh, first, Monique, welcome. Thank you. Hello to everyone. Thank you so many people for putting on your videos. It makes me so happy. Oh, uh, yes. I love it. I love it. Uh, and then why don't you tell us how long you supported Simon and um, what you loved about being an assistant? Oh, man. Uh, so I was with him for almost a decade. It was just under 10 years. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a very short and very long 10 years. You know how you can have a, a day or a year or a week go by that just flies. And all of a sudden you're like, how did that all go down? How did that go so fast? And then other days you're like, is it only two o'clock? So they were some of the longest and shortest days of my entire life. And it really, it was 
being in the system was everything that I was supposed to be. I'm detail oriented. I love activating projects. I love turning ideas into real things. Um, I love being a support system. I love taking care of people. I love fixing problems. So before I even knew that I was born to be an assistant, I was born to be an assistant. So I'm lucky that I actually found that profession. Awesome. Love it. So why is it important for us as assistants to have difficult conversations and and know how to have tough conversations? Yeah. Um, So this is obviously my soapbox. I have two online courses about communication. It is so important to me. Communication to me is the most important skill that we were never taught. You know, we don't take classes in school on how to be a good communicators on how to have converse, hard conversations, how to give feedback, how to take feedback. You know, we learn more about world war in school than we do about how to actually communicate and how to do what we need to do in order to be our best selves. So I'm extremely passionate about teaching communication in general and even more so lately about how to have hard conversations. You know, these conversations, hard conversations are going to happen whether we want them to or not. They are coming at us. Other people want to give us feedback. Other people want to tell us that they that we hurt their feelings or something. These are happening whether we want them to or not. So the only choice we have is to avoid them completely and just not, not talk to any other humans and run away from every situation that could possibly bring in a hard conversation. We can run away or we can do them badly and make more regrets for ourselves, or we can finally figure out how to do them with skill and intention and attention. So I am uh, hell bent if to use that word on teaching the world how to have these hard conversations. I've had a few experiences lately that really kind of knocked me out. I actually had a friend who um, instead of having a hard conversation, she just ghosted me. And this was a friend that I've had for a very long period of time. And I guess I said something that offended her. I wanted to have a conversation with her about it. Uh, and she t- straight up ghosted me. So I was like, even more reason why we need to have these conversations because it's coming at work. It's coming with our family. It's coming with our friendship group. There's no way to get around it. So let's actually learn how to do it well. Yeah. So how could you give us maybe a practical tip on, I'm sure some of you actually, I want to, I want to do some mass confession because mass confession is good for the soul. So raise your hand uh, physically or digitally if you thought of a tough conversation that you need to have when, when she was talking. Okay. Yes. Yes. Lots of people thinking, okay. Oh, great. Now I got to have this tough conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay. So we can all relate. So what's step one, Monique? What, what, okay. You've thought of the person that you have to have that tough conversation with, you know, obviously it's a common thing with the, I'm seeing the number of hands go up. What is step number one? Step number one, as it always is, is to prepare ourselves. We tend to go into these conversations, scribble a couple of notes down about what we need to say, what is going to come out of our mouths, but we rarely pay attention to what we're feeling before we even go into that conversation. What are our motives? What, what happened earlier in the day? You know, where we're coming from? Did I get into a fight with my partner? Am I mad at something that happened at work? Am I bringing in baggage to this conversation? And we so rarely think about what we have to, what weights we're carrying when we're going into these conversations. So first and foremost, we need to make sure that we're going in unencumbered and that we have the right motive. If your motive is to win, to be right, to uh, gain acknowledgement, to prove someone else wrong, very, very common, uh, then we're not going in with the right motive either. And we're probably going to get the experience and we're going to get the outcome that we've been dreading. Um, So a very easy, quick, actionable tip for everyone out there is go in ready, calm yourself, calm your mind, be present. Uh, If you need to meditate, if you need to take a walk, if you need to put your face in the sun, if you need to watch a video of cute puppy dogs on YouTube, whatever it is, 
do whatever it needs to do for you to calm your central nervous system down, calm, calm your inner self down, be present and figure out what your motive is before anything else, even before a word comes out of your mouth. That's my advice. Yeah, I love it. So one thing that I I do to kind of calm my, my inner self, if you will, is I just remind myself that I'm a valuable human being, no matter how well or how poor this, this conversation goes. In other words, if this conversation that I'm about to have goes very, very, very poorly, that doesn't make me less of a valuable person. And so just detaching my worth from how this conversation goes helps me kind of get ready to, to have that conversation. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the other side of it would be how, how can we, a lot of times when we have these tough conversations, we feel ourselves becoming defensive mm-hmm. and, and, or, or even aggressive uh, because we're trying to def- be defensive, whatever. So how do we, how do we combat the urge to defend ourselves? Sure. Uh, so I want to first say that we can and should always separate the, the who from the what, the me from the action, because you might have done something and have uh, caused an action that hurt someone that you needed to, you know, that someone needs to have a hard conversation with you, with you personally, um, to making sure that we separate that we from the what, just because you need to have, someone needs to have a hard conversation with you doesn't make you a bad human. Just like you were saying, Jeremy, you're still a worthy and wonderful and special human being, whether or not somebody has to have a hard conversation with you or not. It is all about our motive. It is all how about how we handle it. And so when we go in with the right intentions and the right motives, um, that's a good start, but making sure that we separate the me the human me from the things that I did, you know, who we are and what we do are two different things. So you might've had an action that you did something, but that doesn't mean that you yourself are a bad or good human being. So separating the we from the what. Um, Also, I always recommend, you know, whenever you feel your, that, that, oh, that, oh, my back's going up against the wall. I can feel it. Um, Ask questions. I immediately will take two big breaths. I will normally tell people I need, I need a second. I take two big, huge, deep yoga breaths, get some oxygen going through my body. um, And then I ask questions. What do I not understand? What do I need to know? What exactly did I do to cause this issue? Um, who else was affected? Uh, there's so many questions that we can ask, but instead we assume that we know all the answers to these questions. We assume we know the intent. So those are my two biggest tips. Separate the we from the we from the me or separate the me from the what and um, make sure you're you're going in with an inquisitive and curious mind so that you can really know what the actions that you did, how they affected other people. Yeah. Well said. So one more question from me, and then we'll, we'll get into uh, questions from you all. So how have you, or how can we as assistants prepare our executives for having a tough conversation or have they're going into a tough meeting when they know it's going to be rough or whatever? Well, how, how can we as assistants, um, prepare our executives? Sure. Uh, So I'll give you two tips. Number one, uh, remember the, it's all about timing and location, 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 Uh, making sure that we have favorable conditions around the conversation that we're about to have. You're not going to go for a run in the rain. So don't come at somebody when it's raining in their world and expect a good outcome. So we know our executive schedule. Don't book a really hard conversation with them after they've had nine meetings back to back and it's at the end of their day and they had a terrible meeting with the board of directors and, 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 and it's a Friday afternoon. We know when the good times are to have these conversations with our executives. Just be weary and making sure that you're doing them at the appropriate time in the appropriate location. Um, the other thing is having the other person, whether they're your executive or not, be prepared for the conversation at hand. Uh, So often we get so stressed out and we get 
so anxious about the conversations that we have, we tend to throw what I call verbal grenades. We unleash the pin, throw it at someone. You hurt me. You did something. Hey, run away, run away. And we're not having them, they're not prepared for the conversation that's coming at them. And we have to be very, very cognizant of not throwing these verbal grenades at our, especially at our executives, let them know, Hey, I need to have a hard conversation with you about X, Y, Z. It involves this thing that happened last week. I've blocked a time on our calendar tomorrow morning. No, you don't have anything to do just before, just after here's the points that I want to handle. Let's talk about it tomorrow. I'm very excited to really get through this with you as a team, as opposed to like, you put a meeting on their calendar and then they look at you like, what's this meeting about? And you're like, Bleh. that's right. never going to work out the way that we want it to. And the outcome that we're expecting is going to happen. So prepare, prepare, prepare them. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, all right, we're going to take a few questions. Uh, Sandra had a good one. I'm going to read, but I actually would prefer you all to raise your hand and we'll, we'd love to see your faces and, and have you ask the question um, on video. So raise your hand and I will call you out for the next question. But the first one is, uh, how have you had the experience where you're in a meeting with your executive and others and someone in the room gets defensive and the whole conversation shifts and you're watching your executive thinking, uh oh, now what? So maybe just some tips for communication or, or redirecting or, you know, policing a, mm -hmm. a hot issue if, if it gets interesting in the middle of a meeting. Sure. Uh, so there's two things. If we want to halt that piece of the conversation at that very moment in order to uh, keep the meeting going forward, um, A, acknowledge the person, acknowledge their fears, acknowledge what's going on. Don't put words in their mouth. Say, it's. I feel like you're... Um, that something's coming up for you. I see your shoulders shrugging, you know, only tell them the things that you're noticing, not you're in a bad spot because you can't tell anyone that, you don't know that for sure. We have to know, talk, talk about the things that you do know that you're observing. Um, it seems to me like you're frustrated because I'm seeing these signs. I want to let you know, I want to talk with you about this and we will uh, we will get to this at some point. I'm making a note right now that we are going to um, go over this again tomorrow at two o'clock. Most of the time, people get very upset when they don't feel heard, when they don't think that their problem is going to be solved. So assuring someone, we, I promise we're going to get to it. You actually have to do it then. Can't, can't just jump over that step, um, but make sure that they know when, they're, uh, when the problem is going to be addressed. Um, now, if it's taking over the conversation, again, listening, hearing people out, letting people have the experience that they do, that they need to have. But I want you to stay calm, clear, relaxed, feeling good, feeling in your center of space, breathing. Somebody else's emotions are not your emotions. You don't have to take on their issues and then you get oh, and while they're oh, and then everyone's oh, and then everyone's going crazy you stay calm your demeanor stays good whether you need to have a couple of breaths or not and frankly if they're at coming at your executive it is your executive's place to shut that conversation down not necessarily yours and you can bring it to his attention and say it seems to me like laura has something to say um why don't we address that issue right now it's all about your calm demeanor. Speaking of calm demeanor, Jennifer actually had a good question. Any tips for controlling your emotions? So we feel like we can't breathe very well. We, we mm -hmm. maybe feel like we're starting to become emotional. And she mm -hmm. mentioned you know, uh, any type of perceived conflict. Often her reaction is to cry. So it's so yeah. difficult to continue the conversation when you feel that emotion, that, and those, those yeah. tears even coming on. Yeah. So I will say first that emotions absolutely have a place in the workspace, as long as it's the right emotion, as long as it is the appropriate emotion. We are emotional beings. We are human beings and we get defensive and we cry and we laugh and we scream and we do all the things. So it is okay. And I personally am on a mission to, to 
bring emotions back into to the workplace and let it be okay and let it be something that we can all do if we need to. Now, I understand at some point that is not uh, appropriate at that manner. Uh, so there's there's various things that you can do. You know, Amy Cuddy's whole book, Presence, I just read Presence again, Amy Cuddy's book for the, I don't know, third time maybe because <laughs> I love it so much. You know, there's something about making ourselves bigger. You know, when we tend to get scared or fearful or uh, upset, we, we get small, we hunch in our shoulders, we put our shoulders down, we lower our chin space. So if you're feeling like you're getting emotional, make yourself bigger, put those shoulders down and pretend that you have weights on them. Turn the corners of your mouth up a little bit, breathing, you know, open your arms, put your both of your feet on the floor and start wiggling your toes. There's a lot of things that we can do to make ourselves bigger so that we're not cowering. This is going to help us show the right emotion rather than this, rather than this tight, tight inwards. Um, so that's just one. I have a lot of tips there, but that's just one easy one. Awesome. All right, raise your hand. We, I want to hear from somebody on video who has a question for Monique. And while we're waiting, um, just a reminder to join us in Denver. I posted the link again. Um, if you want to get her $300 communication online course that she just launched and a discount to the Denver registration all in one bundle, um, you can order today at leaderassistantlive.com slash Denver. Raise your digital hand if you have a question and we'll go to you. I know there's probably a couple more in the chat, but I'm going to pretend to ignore them. And uh, here we go, Lisa, Lisa Sprinkles. I'm going to actually have to unmute you, hang on. Okay, my question is um, one of the big drives that I've had in my career in the last three to five years is kind of working on branding, like my own personal brand, and maybe how do I align with my executive brand? When I interview for a job that I'm going to be taking, the first thing that I ask is, the executive, what is your brand and how does that align with what you're doing now? And I'll be honest with you, in the last few years, every single executive that's been in the field for a long time has been stumped by that question. Like, what is the brand? So my question to you is, you know, I'm very curious of, you know, all the experience, which is amazing that you have. How do you identify, like, what do you think of as your personal brand and, you know, what you're trying to portray as you're meeting with people and teaching and coaching and those kind of things, what's like at the maybe top three things that you look at for your own brand and, you know, keeping that tight. Um, are you asking for me to tell you how to find your own personal brand? Or are you asking me what my personal brand is? What your personal brand is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. So my personal brand has everything to do with being human. I am a human being, not a human doing, and I'm all about being human, which is why I talk about messy and weird and horrible things like hard conversations and feedback and crying in front of your boss. And I will say pretty much anything I need to say because we're human and I want to bring that back. We are not robots. We are not machines. We are absolutely human beings. So that is a huge, huge, huge piece of my brand. Uh, I would also say, you know, I'm, I'm a little outspoken and I always have been. So I think a part of my brand is my loud mouth that I'm willing to kind of say anything. And, uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. Trust me. I got into a lot of trouble from that when I was a kid about my, my loud mouth, but it has brought me to some great places in my life. So I, uh, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I would also, you know, again, I teach human skills. So I'm all about, um, part of my brand is really all about do, doing one step at a time, turning that notch one at a time. You know, we don't have to eat the entire elephant at, at one sitting. You know, what is one step we can do to move forward to be a better version of ourselves? And then what's one more step that we can take? Do 1% every day or 1% every week or 1% every month. I don't care, but just keep turning that dial. And I think that's a part of my, my personal brand. Thank you for that question. Thanks, Lisa. All right, anybody else raise your hand? We've got time for one, maybe two more, depending on how uh, how quick it is. I, I I think this is more of a statement than a question. I just want to say thank you, and I appreciate um, the insight because I'm one of these people that has really, in the last I say decade, stood up for myself 
And I, I've been in those conversations that are difficult. I have cried. And you know what? I don't care because in that conversation, I am letting them know what I'm worth. And I am worth them knowing that they're making me feel like crap. I am worth them knowing that if they keep it up, I'm going to walk out the door. I am worth them knowing that in this environment, if you want to yell and scream, this might be the reaction that you see. And I also want to say to all the women that are out there, and I mean, not just women, men too, that are in this role, that if we know what our worth is and we stand on that platform, the treatment that we get means the tears will be less because they'll respect you. And sometimes I have found when I'm at the edge of tears, it's because I feel disrespected and not heard. And so I feel if you just stand up for yourself and I love you, Monique, because I, I have gotten in trouble with my mouth more times than you can, you can count. And so I'm just like, you know what, forget it. If they don't, if they don't want to value me and understand that I have these opinions and I have feelings and I'm watching what's happening here too, then maybe I don't need to be here. And finding that strength has really helped me just keep championing forward. Yeah. Standing up for ourselves and showing our worth and being the best version of yourself and all of these things has everything to do with self-esteem, self-worth, self-respect. And it has very little to do with being mean, being rude, being ignorant, or being uh, in your face. You know, I want to just be very clear that you can stand up for yourself. You can show your worth. You can be all that you can be. And you don't have to yell and scream and say mean, bad words. So I just, I want to separate that just a little bit. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Mary, do you have a question? I do. Um, so I've found lately that my executive is, has removed me from the executive weekly touch basis that we have. So how do we as admins make our executive feel like what we have to offer is important enough for us to be involved in those conversations. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay. So first we can't make anyone feel anything. Unfortunately, I really wish we all had a little Sega joystick and could just push buttons and make people do things. That would just be so much easier, Uh, but it's not. So the two things I would first ask why you were removed from there and say, I want to have an honest conversation with you about um, why I've been removed. I'm, I'm curious to know and really come open and honest and curious about why that change did happen. Uh, the other thing that I would recommend, uh, or one of the ways that, that I got into all these meetings that I showed that I was worthy to be in those meetings was talk about my strength set, about what I am good at, what are my tendencies, my habits, my strengths, um, and why was it important to have those strengths be a part of the meeting? Uh, so a, when I was going through this exercise with Simon, I said, number one, having more, uh, having more opinions and more strength sets in the room is going to help. Diversity is good. Diversity brings in innovation and uh, unique perspectives and new perspectives. And so we need to have people that think differently, people that come from a different place. We need to have those kinds of people all in the room at the same time. Uh, the other thing that I told him was basically, I said, look, you're a strategist. You go into these meetings looking for the strategy, the overarching way that we're going to move forward as a company, as a team. I hear detail. My strength set is an activator, is a detail oriented. I know what my strength sets are. So when I go into a meeting, I'm listening for what are we going to do? How are we going to make this happen? How are we going to push this forward? So when you leave a meeting, Simon, you're leaving with maybe two action items. And then you come to me and you give me two action items and then five are left on the table and we don't know what they are. If I were to go into the meeting, I would leave with 10 action items and you won't have to tell me what they are. And so I said, look, let's just try it. The meeting on one meeting. And then when I went in that meeting, I was controlled and calm and present and willing to be there. And when we left, he said, did you get the two action items? I said, two. 
I have six. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six. I went through all of the things that he was like, I didn't even think about half of those. And I said, yes, I know. We listen for different things. I have a different strength set than you do. So under showing what your strength set brings to the table and what his strength set, his or hers brings to the table is super duper important. That was a really quick answer, but a quick long winded answer. <clears throat> yeah. Great question. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to try to do, um, I know we're a few minutes over Monique, if it's all right, I will try to get to, uh, these last two questions quickly. Um, and just, you know, again, join us in Denver, we're going to have a lot more time um, in a smaller group, much smaller group. It's a master class. It's intentionally a small, intimate setting where we can really dive in and dig in deep. And then um, you get Monique's online course if you sign up today. And then you'll get, a, you'll get a coaching call with Monique for after the event and then a coaching call with me as well so that you can follow up and really get even deeper um, on all of these topics and more. So hopefully you can join us in Denver, leaderassistantlive.com slash Denver. Uh, Anne-Marie, hello, Anne-Marie. Why don't you uh, share your question really quick, and then we'll get to the service master group in their conference room. So Jeremy and Al Hussein have sometimes acknowledged um, with our group that it, the EA job can be very lonely. And one of the reasons it can be very lonely is because sometimes we are asked to have hard conversations on behalf of our executive with people that report to him, but do not report to us. You know, for example, if we report to the CEO having hard conversations on his behalf with other C-suite, um, you know, direct reports of his, do you have any advice on having, you know, hard conversations with people who are often or maybe always uh, superior to us, you know, on behalf of the CEO, but, but in a way that's not, um, you know, undermining the CEO, not, you know, and not delivering it like, oh, well, this isn't my message. This is, you know, don't shoot the message. You know what I mean? Those kind yeah. of ways. Um, any, any thoughts? So that, that's a hard one. Giving difficult, having difficult conversations and giving feedback on behalf of someone else um, you're, will always be shot as a messenger. That's just because the, the words are coming from your mouth. So that's a very difficult situation to be in. And I, uh, applaud you for doing that and asking the questions about that. Um, feedback is feedback is feedback and people are people are people. So even if they're superior, making sure that you're mentally prepared to go into the conversation, do you have all the content and context around what is happening around the situation at hand, making sure that you go in fully prepared, um, making sure you have your feedback statement. There's, um, I go through in my course, a, a way to a feedback statement, an actual sentence that you can use, making sure you have that prepared um, and what the goals are, keeping the goals of a conversation in mind. Are you just giving information and that's it? Are you giving information because you need something back? You need a, something to happen. You need a change to move forward. You need an apology. What are the motives? And making sure you're staying unbelievably focused on what those motives are in order to have the conversation continue. Um, so that was my really quick answer to that question. All right. Well, last one. Thank you. Service master team. Love to uh, hear your question and, and get a quick answer for you. Um, my question is, is how say, do you... Say your name, please. Say your name. Sorry, I'm Kristen. I... <laughs> I assumed um, your name wasn't... I assumed all of your names weren't Service Master. So. <laughs> I mean, if you want me to be called Service Master, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, is how do you communicate with somebody that isn't actively listening to you when you're trying to have a conversation? They're physically present, but they're not mentally present. And you are trying to um, make suggestions or try to make things work better communication wise between the two of you. So basically, one party is willing, the other party is not. How do you, what are your suggestions on how to get that person to listen? Um, again, unfortunately, we can't make people do things, on <laughs> yeah, but we can't. So if this were me, if I was in a conversation where I saw the other person not, not paying attention, I would stop. I would stop the meeting right then and there and I would put down my pen and I would move everything from out in front of me and I would say, you okay? 
you all right? What's what's happening? What 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 is um, preventing you uh, from being present here, right, right here, right now? Because I can sense from the way that your eyes are. Again, only things that you can see, feel, hear, know that you don't assume and don't put yourself in their position. But the things that you're seeing, you know, I can tell you're looking up, you're looking out the window, you're tapping your foot, whatever it might be. I notice these, so let's just have a conversation about what's going on. And just stop because you talking and talking and talking and talking to try to prove a point is not going to help. It's just going to annoy the other person. So honestly, if it were me, I would stop the conversation. I would say, okay, doesn't seem like now is a great time. Um, We can have a conversation about what's wrong. We can have a conversation about what, what is getting in the way, but then why don't we pick this conversation up tomorrow? How's 2 PM? Just make sure that you're, you're, revisiting the conversation so it doesn't die. Um, but I wouldn't keep, yeah. I wouldn't keep screwing it in the wall if it's not that good. Perfect. Thank you. Please review on Apple podcasts. Go bullos.com.